Um, so our next speaker is uh, David Reed. He's payload engineering expert, and he's going to talk about how to adapt them for different forms of life. All right, good morning. Uh, my name is David Reed. I work for uh, a, a company called Redwire Corporation. We are developers of uh, spaceflight hardware, uh, predominantly within the human spaceflight program and currently uh, on the International Space Station. So I am uh, an engineer by training, as I said. So I'm going to talk a little bit about engineering perspectives uh, for uh, biological systems that we fly uh, in the human spaceflight program. So most of the work is done using model organisms. Uh, there's some information here about model organisms, but specifically uh, from an engineer's perspective, uh, folks are encouraged to use model organisms because they're, to be quite honest, well sorted out. Uh, I mean, they typically have a large body of scientific knowledge. It's been uh, developed in a terrestrial environment. But for us, uh, we understand, uh, engineers understand how to uh, maintain these organisms in spaceflight conditions. Their husbandry, we basically have to build a small life support system for anything that is going to fly in space. I'm not going to talk about all model organisms today. I'm going to focus my talk in this brief time on plants, which is where I focused a lot of my engineering uh, work in the last 20 years. So briefly, why are plants important? Well, uh, we can answer some of these questions on Earth, but they're the same sorts of importance that we have in space. First is food. Obviously, we're going to consume the plants as we go into space. Second is as food for food. I don't think there's going to be a lot of space-faring uh, chickens right now, but uh, you know, in the future, uh, as we move not just to the space station, but to other surfaces, to larger craft, uh, food as food will be important, and also as, as uh, a substrate for uh, bioengineered organisms and microbes. Plants are also important for atmospheric revitalization. You know, they pull carbon dioxide out of the air most of the time. Uh, and I say most of the time because during dark cycles they actually put carbon dioxide back into the air. So uh, regulating just carbon dioxide with plants in engineering systems is, is a complicated and dynamic task. There are also oxygen generators. We all are familiar with that from basic biology. Uh, something that most people don't think about plants is that they're excellent water cyclers, which is to say that they are really good at taking a wastewater stream, like a gray water stream, say your wash water, uh, or even water as an output from uh, uh, waste collection devices, and uh, draws that up into the plant, uh, transpires it as humidity, and then as an engineer, I simply need a cold plate somewhere in order to condense that and, and generate potable water or reusable water. Without all the, the chemical systems, without physical separation systems, uh, the plants do this uh, very efficiently uh, from a resource perspective. Uh, and then lastly, psychological effects are a big reason to have plants in space. Uh, it's becoming more and more apparent that as you're on a longer, longer uh, space flight, astronauts crave uh, seeing something that reminds them of home. Uh, we have astronauts that actually volunteer to spend their, their Saturdays and Sundays um, just tending our plants, uh, not because the plants necessarily need tending, but because they like to go into the, the uh, facilities and, and it reminds them of, of being at home. When we talk about plant research that's conducted in space, it's kind of broadly broken down into three areas. First, we have researchers that are physiologists. They're mostly interested in, you know, how does the plant itself function? How is the plant itself responding to the spaceflight environment? I'm being careful to say spaceflight environment, not simply microgravity environment, uh, because we're going to talk about all the different spaceflight effects in just a minute. Uh, Separate from that, although related, are the, the crop people. The crop people obviously are interested in what's happening with an individual plant, but uh, only kind of superficially so. They're more interested in understanding how can I grow a large abundance of plants because the intent is to use them for uh, either as a direct food source or as part of a bioregenerative life support system. And that brings us then to the third group, which are life support people. Um, truthfully, uh, we're not quite there yet in terms of having a closed-loop closed loop bioregenerative life support system, uh, which is basically what we have here on the Earth, right? We don't go outside and add chemistry or, or mechanical devices uh, to our atmosphere or to our, our own you know, individual biome in order to stay alive. 
Plants just kind of do this as, as a part of what they do, but it's not so simple when you try and do it in spaceflight. So what are some of these spaceflight effects on plants? Well, we can talk about direct effects on plants, which is to say uh, the first and obvious one is, is, is the lack of gravity. But what does the lack of gravity actually do? Well, uh, it does a number of things. First, as you can imagine, it can disorganize uh, the, where the roots and shoots of a plant go, but we can usually overcome that with phototropism, which is you know, providing light to the plant uh, as a, a way to overcome the fact that the plant isn't able to sense gravity. Uh, but spaceflight affects uh, tropisms, which is to say uh, even the, the response to light or the response to the microgravity can be influenced in space. It uh, dramatically affects fluid movements within the plants themselves in a manner similar in which uh, happens to an astronaut. If you've ever seen pictures of astronauts, they always look like their faces are very full. That's because of a large fluid shift that occurs uh, on, on Earth. Your body works very hard to move fluids from your legs you know, up to your head in space. It doesn't have to work so hard, but it doesn't know that, so it does it anyway. And the fluids move up into your head. Same thing happens with plants. Uh, this sort of um, odd nature in which uh, fluids moves around uh, has to be accounted for. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, and what this, this picture uh, means to depict, is that generally speaking, plants uh, respond to the spaceflight environment uh, in a stressful manner. They, they see spaceflight as a stress. Um, however, the, the manner in which they express that stress is not always uh, what we would expect. Uh, in the early days of spaceflight, there were a lot of um, spaceflight effects that people thought they were seeing in plants, uh, but it turns out that a lot of it had to do with limitations in the engineering that we had, uh, and so that the box itself, as we like to say, was, was causing an effect of spaceflight, not even the spaceflight environment itself. Um, the, the plants that you see here, actually, there's the whole group of plants uh, from, does this work? Yeah, from, from left to right. Uh, you can see a number of plants, but you only appear to see roots underneath uh, the plants on the right. Those plants have been genetically, genetically modified with a, a green fluorescent protein uh, reporter gene uh, to indicate uh, that the plant is uh, firing off some stress genes, but those are stress genes associated with heat shock. Now, this plant is not actually undergoing a heat stress at all, but that's the sort of inappropriate response that the plant is having in space. So in this case, physiologists came to us and said we want to in interrogate uh, heat shock genes, and we need you engineers to develop a plant growth system uh, that, that we can do so, including a miniaturized uh, imager that can do this spectral imaging uh, in space. Well, one last point on this slide that's worth mentioning is immune system suppression. So again, much like humans, plants' immune system uh, gets suppressed in, in space flight, and this can be something uh, deleterious that uh, we're only just now beginning to explore the interactions between the plant microbiome uh, and, and the plants in space. But there are these so-called indirect effects on plants. So these are the sorts of things that we engineers worry about uh, more so than those direct effects that the, that the plant folk do. Uh, first is that there's just poor air exchange. I mean, poor movement of fluids in general. Fluids, regardless of whether they are atmospheric fluids or you know, in the form of, of liquids. There's no buoyancy-driven convection in space, both in a macro sense within, the, um, within a, a plant growth box, but also in a micro sense you know, within the plants themselves. Uh, we get these uh, fairly significant boundary layers that get set up, uh, both on individual leaves and within the canopy of plants when they're grown in our systems in space. So we have to use forced air convection, basically fans, uh, but strategically placed in order to disrupt these boundary layers so that you don't end up with a, a buildup, say, of metabolic products in the boundary layer uh, directly uh, next to the leaves. Uh, root zone water management is horribly challenging. Um, water in space is dominated by capillary forces. Um, things like bubbles uh, become the equivalent of a, of a cement wall uh, in a fluid system, uh, meaning that it's very hard to move water past a bubble uh, once you, you get one entrained in a system. So uh, how we deal with fluids is, is, is constantly challenging. Uh, and then furthermore, those fluids get fouled. Um, we, if we have a water source, again, you can imagine typically a plant system is not aseptic. 
So it's exposed both to astronauts, to the environment and the space station, and thus is you know, very quickly contaminated and colonized by you know, everything that's in the space station. And so uh, biofilm formation can, can clog systems. Uh, it's a constant challenge. And lastly, growth system thermal performance. Um, you take for granted this computer sitting on the desk in front of me right now rejects heat by having the heat just you know, buoyantly convected away from uh, the computer. That doesn't happen in space. What happens in space is you get a sphere of heat that begins to grow uh, directly around uh, the computer, uh, and eventually it can lead to degraded performance both in the, the subsystems of the computer and ultimately failure, uh, premature failure. So when we have to develop hardware for flight in space, uh, crew safety is number one. Uh, I, I always sit down with the scientists, and I have a very blunt speech <laughs> in which I tell them, you have to understand that uh, the crew safety comes first, the vehicle safety is a close second, and your mission success is sadly a, a distant third. Um, we have to make sure that we uh, can't harm the crew because you can't just send them to the... There is no med bay like we have on the Starship Enterprise where you can go and, and get you know, professional medical treatment in space. Resources are scarce. As you can imagine, uh, I mean, the amount of power that's available, uh, asset and descent, mass and volume is very challenging uh, to get up and down. Uh, the materials that we use, we have to be very cautious about, not only for obvious things like their, their capacity to burn, but we have to think past their capacity to burn at what the, uh, what the products of the combustion might be. I mean, smoke is bad, toxic smoke is worse, is what I like to tell people. So uh, it makes it very challenging, the materials that we have to use. Uh, not just to survive a launch uh, environment, but then for use on the ISS and future platforms as well. As much as we can, we try to remove the engine, remove the astronaut from the equation. Astronauts are sharp people. They work very hard. Basically, every minute of their waking hours for six months at a time uh, is programmed for them. And uh, you can imagine that can wear a person down. They can make mistakes. If you have a multi-million dollar piece of equipment, and a researcher who spent the last 10 years of his life preparing for an experiment, we can't afford for simple mistakes to be made. For example, a crew member connecting a syringe full of fluid to the wrong quick disconnect. Just because those two quick disconnects happen to be identical in their, in their geometry. It's not enough to have a great big label on them that says, this is port A and this is port B. The astronauts have still, I've seen it myself, uh, unfortunately made mistakes. So by uh, keying them or having a different uh, connection type for the two ports. It's our way of engineering the astronaut out of uh, the system. Uh, there's some other things here that you can read, but another thing that I'll, I will touch on that most of the time uh, researchers don't think about are the operational constraints. Uh, the operating environment in spacecraft is very dynamic. It's constantly changing. Um, you know, if, if the toilet breaks today, then everything that you had planned for tomorrow is now off the shelf because the toilet is, and the oxygen generators, for example, are two things that absolutely must work all the time. That means there's a constant replanning effort that goes on. Uh, the complexities of the operating environment uh, are very challenging uh, for a team of, of, of engineers. Here's a picture of a bunch of uh, pieces of spaceflight equipment, many of which I've had uh, something to do with over the last 20 years. Uh, a, a few takeaway notes. First is that they're small. If you, uh, if you think of a microwave oven, they're all about the size of a microwave oven or smaller. Two cubic feet is kind of a typical size. Uh, the second is that in a lot of them, you can't see the plants at all. Uh, they're all closed up within you know, multiple levels of containment, uh, either for uh, biosafety reasons or simply because in order to you know, engineer the environment, that, that's what we have to do. We can talk uh, during coffee or something more about some of these individually if you'd like. Uh, just to let you know what's currently available from NASA, uh, the first is the veggie system, the second is the plant habitat. Veggie is basically lights and a small fan uh, for uh, growing plants. Uh, the second is plant habitat, or advanced plant habitat is a refrigerator-sized, uh, very large, uh, very well-controlled environment. We control the atmosphere, we recycle water, we have uh, lights, we have cameras. Uh, my company manages the advanced plant habitat for NASA, so all of the research that's conducted in there is, is developed uh, by my company. 
But I want to talk a little bit about some of the other equipment that's developed exclusively by my company that is available to you. I mean, it's available commercially for people to use. Uh, it's available for people from India to, uh, to uh, collaborate, uh, to fly on the space station right now, and on the commercial platform space stations that are coming in the very near future uh, as a follow-on to the International Space Station. First is something called PONS. Uh, PONS is uh, in response to a, a researcher's challenge. He says, I want water to be uh, available all the time uh, in a very large quantity with no moving parts, no sensors, uh, no electronics. So PONS is essentially uh, an open box of water with uh, a flower pot inside of it, to simplify it. Uh, and so the real challenge here from an engineering perspective is how do you convince the water to stay inside of an open box and not simply come out into the spacecraft? We did this with a, with a combination of uh, engineering techniques for uh, uh, utilizing capillary forces, what we call strange internal geometries, which are internal geometries of the box designed to, uh, to convince the water, and I make it sound like it's a living thing, but it really it functions a lot like a living thing, but to convince the water to stay in the bottom of the box the same way it does uh, if the box was sitting on the table here. Uh, at some point, maybe later, it could show a video uh, of the box filling on orbit, and you can't tell the difference other than an astronaut floating by in the background, but the box isn't filling here on the ground. Uh, Somehow I'm missing a chart. Okay, so we have a we have a small uh, centrifuge on orbit uh, called the MVP, the Multi-Use Variable G Platform. And MVP, uh, you might say, well, why would you go to space and have a centrifuge uh, in order to generate gravity? And the reason is that uh, we want to give astro give researchers the opportunity to study fractional gravity. Uh, which they can't do on Earth. You can't study lunar or Martian gravity effects on, uh, say, nematodes or plants uh, unless you go into space. So there are actually two centrifuge rotors. They're each about the size of, uh, of a pizza pan. And we can rotate them individually at anywhere from zero to two gravity. So if you would like to, for example, explore lunar and Martian gravity effects side by side within the same facility, you can do that. Um, uh oh, maybe my time's up. No, <laughs> I'm almost done. Um, so what I'm showing here is the Phytofuge. Phytofuge uses a small custom Petri dish in order to study uh, seedling science, early germination, and, and plant establishment science of Arabidopsis plants. So there's lights, a small camera uh, inside of this uh, centrifuge module that you can see here. Uh, plant habitat, as I mentioned, is a great big facility. These are just kind of some glamour shots showing, showing some of the different crops that we've grown in, in plant habitat in the last couple of years, radishes, chili peppers, um, and we're, we're preparing to, to grow tomatoes in there as well. Okay, it's not responding, but I got it. Um, so next up is greenhouse. Greenhouse is, is kind of a deployable tent. It, it goes up all folded down, um, so it's very compact and, and very space efficient for launching. But then once it gets uh, on orbit, it will be expanded up to, to make a tent about this tall uh, that will be located inside of the Cygnus module. When Cygnus comes up and docks, it brings a lot of storage with it, but uh, then it's just basically waiting to become a trash can because Cygnus doesn't uh, deorbit in a controlled way, it, it burns up on the way back. So while it's up there and all the stuff is out of it, hey, it's a big open module. We said, why don't we put something in there that's easy to de deploy, but can then be taken down and, and, and thrown away. So that's what Greenhouse will be providing. It's more like veggie in that it just provides lights and, and, a, and a fluid system. Uh, and then in the future, you know, one day we hope that we'll be on Mars uh, growing things. Uh, my company hopes to be a part of surface systems, uh, both on the moon and on Mars. As I mentioned earlier, we're already a, a part of uh, the, uh, the, the designs that are going into the commercial uh, uh, space stations to come next. Uh, and then just very quickly, um, this was a picture of that, uh, that variable G platform, uh, the, the two centrifuge rotor uh, that we have uh, on space station right now. And if anyone wants to talk to me later, we could talk about uh, an incubator called ADCEP. We could talk about an x-ray machine used for doing bone densitometry uh, experiments on mice. 
and we could talk about uh, 3D tissue printer and in-space cell manufacturing that we have. Thank you. We have time for one question. Hello, sir. It's a very common statement that aging will be different from Earth to space. Am I right? And could you see any uh, dragging of total lifespan of plants in space? Like uh, increase in the doubles, uh, doubling time of the cells kind of thing, sir. So um, again, I am not a plant physiologist. I am an engineer. But what I can tell you is that uh, given a properly designed box, uh, the plant growth, uh, the plant's life cycle is about the same, actually, uh, in space as it is on Earth. Now, it might be to someone's ad advantage uh, as we move forward to uh, develop uh, strains that have an accelerated life cycle. I mean, no one wants to wait an entire month to have a salad, for example. Uh, you, you would like to be able to have it more often than that. Um, and we could talk also about the concept of uh, having multiple growth systems and phasing uh, the manner in which you plant so that you have plants available all the time, say, for consumption. Thank you, David, for a wonderful talk.